indeed my idea in this lecture because it just happened that I also uh, recently uh, wrote an article about this, which is just about to be published by Slavic Review. So, and there's going to be also a critical forum with several contributions about the protests in Belarus. Uh, so, I thought once I, I, I wrote something, I can now more or less be more or less confident being in, in discussing this with others. So, my uh, you obviously saw how many historical symbols, well, even if you briefly uh, follow the news from Belarus, you could have noticed a lot of sy historical symbolism and in, uh, in performances and protest images on the streets. And so the, this is my idea to actually to try to make sense of it. Why, what kind of symbols, what they meant, uh, and how, why they um, made the way to, to this Belarusian pro protest environment. So before I start talking about protests, I promise I'll do this, but it's going to be probably second half of my lecture. And this first half of the lecture, I want to kind of to draw a little bit of background of from, from my understanding how, how I see this dynamics of identity politics, memory politics, and Belarus before 2020. And here you see this slide I'm showing that what, what I, I think can be distinguished, differentiated in the history of the Belarusian independence, uh, what kind of uh, periods are different, different kind of different um, eras and different types of development in Belarus, and with the, which the different not only in terms of political leadership, but also in terms of uh, the domin dominant discourses of Okay. Uh, can you please turn off your mics once again? Thank you. Uh, because it was very loud. So, and I think this is going to be also the structure of my lecture because I'm going to talk first about this first three years of Belarusian independence and independence and it became a sovereign country. And these three years can be de de described as, as a period of nationalizing state. And here I refer to the, the, the scholar Roger Rogers Baker, who just defined this state as a state of when one particular ethnocultural core nation uh, tries to establish uh, itself as a foundation for, uh, for, uh, for, for, for the formation of uh, the ideology of the country of this and state politics in meaning by that language politics, historical politics, memory politics, etc, 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 educational politics, and you'll see this in the moment. Second st uh, stage or st st second period, as you can see, was quite long, it lasted 26 years uh, from the moment when Belarus um, uh, dear Mrs. Uh, Pekka, so I, I sorry me for interrupting, but um, I have a question from my group that we just see on the first slide from your presentation. Is it right or? Yes, yes, that's right. I haven't moved yet. Ah, and actually, okay, so. I, I'm, I'm actually, huh, yeah, yeah, this, I'm still there, but I I've actually moved. Yeah, I'm, I'm still here. Sorry, it's just because I want to present this. That's fine. Okay, thank you very much. For this. Yeah, uh, in a moment we will, in, 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 a, in a moment we will move to the second one. So the second stage uh, is going to be Belarus under Lukashenko. What it meant for the country, and here I have to say that my my kind of interpretation of this development of Belarus under Lukashenko is slightly different. Many other scholars who write about the Belarusian identity because I do think that Bil Bil Lukashenko actually was not not only continued kind of the, the Soviet development, but also launched the project of, uh, project of nationalizing um, uh, uh, Soviet legacy in Belarus and kind of recycling socialism in, in the Belarusian development. And finally, this was a second, the second period of Indian history of Belarus. We don't know how long it's going to last. Uh, and this is what started in last summer and it continues till, day, till today when the struggle of identity, this was a title actually of my book, has transformed and melt, uh, kind of tra transformed into the battle for power and the, the Lukashenko now, he's, he's not trying to play any identity politics anymore, he's, he simply wants to stay in power at any cost. And now we finally move to the second slide. So what I'm trying to, I'm going to show here how this during this first period of the Belarusian independence, what was happening back then in the country, what kind of political project of nation was 
um, articulated in the political discourses and what kind of instruments and policies were implemented in order to, to, to kind of to realize this uh, uh, project of the Belarusian nation in practice of the uh, nation building. Uh, first and foremost, uh, the first anti-communist and uh, also anti-Soviet oppositional movement in Belarus was created in 1988 and this was Belarusian People's Front uh, which once Belarus uh, created the legislative uh, the, uh, ground for, for multi-party system, uh, it also was registered as a political party. So what, what uh, the whole idea was actually to, to make sure that Belarus uh, cuts off from um, Belarusian people as well, they'll cut from their and break from the Soviet past, they become an one nation, one uh, uh, language uh, society with all people moving to speak in Belarus and only you probably know, I mean, I haven't asked this, but I assume you, you have some basic knowledge about the Belarusian society, so you know probably that the majority of people speak in Russian. So the second instrument in addition to language policy was the idea of rewriting history, emphasizing pre-Soviet or non-Soviet uh, periods of the Belarusian history and showing that Soviet history was not really important for Belarusians, Belarusians becoming a nation. And a second important, uh, third, sorry, important element of this kind of policy of, of becoming nation was geopolitical reorientation and the, the whole idea was Belarus would become just like Lithuania, just like Poland, like Czech, Czech Republic, they, they become the just distant, small Eastern European nation, uh, kind of connected with multi, in multiple ways with other Eastern European nations, but kind of distant and going away from its relationship with Russia. And here you see the, 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 the extract for this citation from the program of the Belarusian People's Front. Uh, about the import, which talks about the import Sorry for interruption once again. Language. But we yeah. see still this uh, first uh, slide. Yeah, that's fine. That's fine because I'm talking exactly about the about the the, the fragment extract from the Belarus program of the Belarusian People Front. I'm talking exactly what it is on the slide. This. Yes, because I, okay, I got so questions from the next one. Yeah, I see. No problem. So uh, just a little bit to unpack what I mentioned in the, in the previous slide, what I was talking about, for the example of language policy uh, in the still Soviet, actually, uh, Belarusian Soviet, uh, Supreme Soviet, uh, adopted the, the, the law on languages in the Belarusian Soviet Socialist Republic. So it was even before the establishment of uh, sovereignty, state sovereignty. And you can see the whole idea of implementing this one nation, one language program, because it was anticipated in this law that um, the, the Belarusian will become the language of science, culture, media within three years, language of congresses, conferences, and state decrees within three to five years, business within five years, legal matters within a decade. So it, it anticipated that actually within 10 years, Belarus uh, will move from this bilingual uh, but dominant, uh, dominated by Russian uh, linguistic um, universe, it will become very this uh, very normal Eastern European country with, with, full, with this whole national uh, life, uh, public life, fully moved to the Belarusian language. What is also really uh, uh, kind of well, not not important worth mentioning that. At that time, precisely, because we are talking about the beginning of the 90s, there are also several um, political or social movements that, that opposed this law and called this law undemocratic uh, because they, they kind of uh, were thinking about this the, the, the just the society which has just been liberated from this pressure of totalitarian country all of a sudden moves to the different type of ideology which again, once again uh, imposes a uh, specific type of choices that the, 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 the parents, for example, had no choice, um, were not given a choice which a uh, language that children are going to be educated. And this was seen as undemocratic. So it's just kind of, but we are talking about this three years um, before 1994. Another example of how 
what I mentioned at the beginning is that the whole idea was to imagine reinvent, reimagine Belarus as non-Soviet or even anti-Soviet uh, society. Uh, so what, what, what was mobilized the different instruments of creating society which would separate or see their Soviet past in rather negative terms and see that this is a period of denationalization, you know, the, uh, total suppression, etc., etc. So one another uh, instrument of such um, Soviet othering of Sovietness um, or alienating the Sovietness uh, was the instruments of historical reckoning and restorative, restorative justice. What, it mean, what is meant by that in the literature? It is about uh, the commemorating the victims of previous regime, of the Soviet regime. In the Belarusian context, it was first and foremost the victims of Stalinism, of course. Uh, and this is how it started, and it was actually worth mentioning that also the Belarusian People's Front uh, started with the history of a very peculiar site in the Belarusian uh, memorial landscape. It's a Kura party, it's, it's a memorial, and uh, it's a site of mass execution and burial site uh, on the outskirts of Minsk, which was discovered actually in June 1988 for the first time. There is a whole story how it was discovered, how the first article was published. I'm not going to, into details, but it's really important, but this particular event initiated a long kind of a, uh, it became a, a, a quite a had a kind of snowballing effort because it initiated the the, the formation of movement uh, the the martyrology uh, Mar 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 martyrologue committee in Belarus uh, it actually um, there, there were several societies like the association of the victims of uh, political repression was registered and many other events which happened. What was also very important was that Belarusian People's Front, which at that time was still social movement, not political party. But it acquired, uh, the, their political agenda acquired much high visibility kind of in public space. And they also had uh, several members of this uh, society uh, who was elected in the Belarusian parliament. They managed to kind of to push through to lobby several important legislative acts, which made this whole agenda of memorialization of the victims of mass repression in Belarus uh, very important. And the, here is just several of much more like multiple legislative acts, which kind of push this whole uh, idea of remembering these victims of Stalinism and broader also victims of uh, Soviet repression in order to demonstrate, to kind of to remind people that Soviet Union was not just about, you know, this was a relative stability, which people, many people were thinking about in the 90s, the, uh, but it was also about repression, it was about mass killing, it was about uh, gulag camp, uh, mass execution, etc. This was this all these events were kind of brought forward to, to, to the public discussion to to raise the awareness of um, of, of this story. And next issue, as I mentioned before, it was about geopolitical kind of locating uh, in uh, the Belarus on the map. Obviously, we can't move country right from one another from one place to another. It is that it is where it is on the map. But what can be done with the, with the help of political discourses and geopolitical discourses, but even broader with geocultural kind of discourses, you can situate the, the national development, the story of national development in a specific context. And this is what what was while. During the Soviet time, and immediately, um, well, and later, actually, it returned with, with Lukashenko coming to power. Uh, on uh, the right, you can see this post-Soviet East Slavic or Eurasian space, whatever you, you can think about. And this is how Belarusians develop, Belarusians' development was seen, kind of being seen as an entangled, integrated into this broader space of post-Soviet uh, countries or, or former Soviet space. While uh, in this new development in, since 1991, um, major political elites of those anti-Soviet, anti-communist, they were thinking about Belarus as a very, the, the aspiration was to, make, to see Belarus just a very normal 
just standard Eastern European small country. And you can see on the map here, like when you look at the map, well, Belarus is no different. And it's slightly smaller than Poland in Ukraine. It's slightly bigger than Lithuania, but it's actually, it's surrounded at least from uh, three sides by four different small Eastern European nation. And what they wanted is just to be just like them, just like Poland, like the Slovakia or Lithuania, just to be small nation and to see themselves in the community of these Eastern European nations. In this context, I, I kind of want to also to bring here a, a perspective on the status of nationalism and the importance of this transnational space, because we kind of used to think about national, nationalism and national ideology as kind of self-centered, like, like the whole idea of how we define our community, the uh, collective identity, uh, thinking uh, exclusively in national terms, but uh, from quite for quite some time already, scholars who write about nationalism, they also emphasize that it, nationalism is not only about one country, it's very often and it's also about the, the whole idea of where this national uh, community is placed in terms of its development, because none of, not, not, not a single nation actually developed in isolation from, from others, right? And you probably perfectly know that uh, the whole this tensions and dynamic about, for example, the, the about development of Polishness, whether we are in the Europe, European nation, whether we are used in European nation. In Belarus, this story of kind of understanding national development in context of transnational space is very complicated because there's a whole idea of place in Belarus in one, on, the, on one map or another map, it's contested. Uh, so during the Soviet times, there was this whole narrative of Belarus as being part, uh, part of East Slavic civilization or space, whatever you call it, Ruski Mir. Nowadays, it's kind of fashionable concept. So now I was talking about this transnational space uh, in the development of the Belarusian uh, nation. And this is just, I, I referred to, to this quote from Mark Basin, from Norwegian uh, political scientist, who was writing about the national ideologies of post-communist states, which never actually uh, are developed in isolation, but always present um, themselves uh, within the broader space of supranation, so-called, whether it's been European community or Eurasian community or uh, Eastern, uh, Eastern Slavic civilizational space, etc. So the, this is what I, I tried to say, and actually I did try to develop a little bit this idea about the internal transnationalism so in the context of social memory, and I, I was in the light in the, 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 the memory politics. in Belarus, in one of the articles, you can actually go and, and read a little bit about this, this dynamics and this tension between national and transnational states. So what is important in Belarus uh, that these uh, different political projects or different discourses imagine uh, Belarusian space of Belarus in a very different way, whether it's Eastern European and this here I refer to the map which I showed before or Eurasian space or broader for Soviet space. Okay, try to change. I changed my slide. Just thank you. <laughs> yeah. Um, it works now. Yeah, another example of kind of understanding and rethinking the place of Belarusian identity and development of the Belarusian nation uh, is, a, is an example of the Grand Duchy of Lithuania. For example, in the Soviet historiography, this, this uh, Grand Duchy of Lithuania, uh, of Lithuania state was interpreted as a Lithuanian state where Belarusians were suppressed, the national development was halted, so it was kind of totally alienated, it was excluded kind of from the narrative of the Belarusian development. So what was what happens in the post-Soviet inter interpretation, the Grand Duchy of Lithuania has been, and also to some extent, probably lesser extent, Polish-Lithuanian Polish Commonwealth, were interpreted as the opposite, as a very conducive to the Belarusian national development, in some uh, in some Belarusian uh, text on, uh, on history, it uh, even uh, it uh, even it has been presented as a largely Belarusian state. I mean, I mean the Grand Duchy of Lithuania. But again, it shows that how through the reappropriation of some uh, historical periods, some narratives from, uh, relating to the past, it 
it allows actually to reinterpret the, 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 the identity project in the present. Again, I'm changing my slide. Uh, can you note, Maxine, that you, did, you, you see a different slide? So what happened in 1994, it happens what I call the U-turn in the national building and national building project. You remember I, I showed this information about law policy, about historical uh, reckoning, uh, commemorating the uh, victims of Stalinism, also geopolitical reorientation towards Europe, and everything, all, all these projects have been kind of suspended because uh, the, the, the Lukashenko, when he, he came to power, he, he came with the whole idea of we don't break, we, we don't kind of despise our development, whatever happened to us in the Soviet past, we kind of try to continue. Uh, I'm not going here into the details why it happened, because well, what, whatever we say about Lukashenko and his following elections, uh, he was winning. Uh, we, we know for sure that in 1994, the elections were fair and, and transparent, and he did win these elections in a, demo, in a democratic way. So his identity project for Belarusians was kind of very much about recycling Soviet uh, 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 socialism, as, as again, I, I wrote about this in one of my articles about like, recycling socialism. Uh, in terms of language policy, he proved very democratic, so calls he, because he said, we are not going to pressurize people. They can speak language, whatever they prefer. So once again, people were now uh, given the right to choose the language of the children's schooling. And this immediately reflected in the choices. Uh, for example, the number of third grade students living in Russian from 25% in 1994, when Lukashenko came to power, rose to 62% in 1994 following years. So clearly the, the society, the people just prefer to, to switch back to Russian. Another element of his identity project or his kind of interpretation of the past, he, instead of ethno-linguistic kind of nationalist uh, idea, he offered to be the Belarusian's um, identity on the idea of uh, reappropriation uh, of what was happening in the Soviet Union, yeah. again, very much uh, maintaining close connections with Russia and other post-Soviet uh, states, because we obviously we probably know that Belarus also not only signed the Union with Russia in 1996, which in fact remained rather rather very formal sta state. I, I'm not sure if, how, how much impact uh, this signed union had on the development in, in Belarus or Russia for, for that matter, but also economics, economic uh, uh, union with uh, Eurasian customs union was probably much more important because it created uh, real instruments for integration and cooperation with countries in post-Soviet countries. Uh, again, I'm moving further. And here, instead of historical reckoning and thinking about Soviet past as, as a period of suppression, as a period of suffering, about remembering victims of the Stal of especially Stalinism, but also in general about Soviet past, uh, Lukashenko's whole idea about uh, thinking about the past was rather uh, much more positive. For example, the whole post World uh, Second World War reconstruction period was uh, has been. Inter interpreted as a golden age for the Belarusian development, uh, because what was proposed to, to kind of to emphasized in, in the in the historical narrative that Belarus developed, kind of moved and became uh, acquired, uh, occupied, be became one of the leading countries uh, in among so among sorry not countries republics in the Soviet Union in terms of its uh, Soviet development. Also, the, the whole post-war reconstruction uh, was seen as a period when uh, Belarus transformed into some sort of shop window of the Soviet lifestyle. And obviously, it's not, it wasn't, uh, it, it's not exactly correct to say that this was about um, continuing Soviet, so, Soviet project per se, because there was no idea of communism whatsoever. And in fact, this communist ideology was completely removed from the uh, political uh, uh, discourse and ideology. And it's 
they, instead it was replaced some sort of interpretation of national tradition. But this national tradition, uh, kind of, uh, instead of other in the Soviet uh, past, as, as was done during the, at the beginning of 90s, it actually involved a very thorough reappropriation and recycling, reinterpreted with an emphasis of national achievements of Belarusians as nation, rather than talking about the sole post Soviet Union. And what I, I think is really important also, like here I want to address to some um, existing scholarship on the history of the Soviet Union, because it's very often the Soviet Union has been perceived, for example, through the lens of Stalin, and Stalin is indeed the most kind of um, famous brand in, in among historians of the Soviet Union because it's everyone wants to know a little bit more about Stalin. But um, the, 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 the late socialism period was quite different from Stalinist period. And, and many people who uh, lived in the 90s or in 2000s didn't really remember Stalin, but what they did remember, they, re they remembered this late socialism, which was relatively stable, relatively prosperous, and at, at least non-violent era in uh, the development of Belarusian society. I changed the slide. Can you see this? Maxim, yeah, okay. So um, yes, as an illustration of this, yeah, as an illustration of this positive attitude towards the Soviet past in uh, the Belarusian political discourse, I, I, I want to show you an example of patrimonialization, of heritageization, if you want, of the Soviet inheritance. For example, in 2004, the Lutheran authorities are nominated Minsk a central avenue. This is just different photographs of this um, central avenue in Minsk. Uh, it, uh, it was uh, built in the 50s and uh, until more or less 60, this major and of, uh, example the, 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 of Stalinist architecture in, in the Russian capital. So it was nominated for inclusion in the UNESCO World Heritage tentative list. And obviously it was about the recognition, about uh, a recognition of this particular material legacy, material, material inheritance from the Soviet development in Belarus uh, and its importance for the Belarusian national uh, building. Uh, while, in fact, sorry, I, I, I went too far. Uh, so, so what I want to say that, in fact, this um, later on, uh, this nomination was withdrawn by the Belarusian authorities because they decided that actually, if they succeed, it will prevent any changes in this in this avenue, and it's going to be very complicated for for urban development of of this. Uh, street, so it, uh, they withdrew the, the submission, but nevertheless, the whole uh, avenue, uh, Independence Avenue, uh, it has been registered uh, on the, as a national cultural heritage in Minsk, uh, uh, in Belarus. What is really interesting, these are just the photographs, for, this is a page from the catalog of the Belarusian cultural heritage. So what is registered, it's not just the whole avenue as a pass, as, as a total, as an ensemble, but also every single building on this avenue has been registered as a cultural monument. So it's kind of uh, emphasizes the, 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 kind of the, the symbolic importance of this uh, for the Belarusian uh, interpretation and vision of the past. Another example, what is really important for understanding uh, Lukashenko's project of uh, the Belarusian history is uh, the nationalizing and the, the, history, the Soviet historical narrative of the Second World War. And again, I just decided to, just to show you the illustration how this whole story, because we obviously don't have time to go into the details, how exactly it has been nationalized, but uh, you can see on this, uh, on the right si uh, side, on the, on the, sorry, on the left side, I guess. Uh, of this new prominent uh, image of the uh, new museum of the history of Great Patriotic War, which was opened in 2014. And this, I, I ask you to remember this image because we will get back to this particular building in when we will be talking, uh, I'll be speaking about um, protest. So this is uh, kind of the, the architectural manifestation and illustration of this prominent role of the historical narrative of the Second World War of Great Patriotic War in the history of Belarus. And on the other side, you see this was an actually previous building, 
which was um, built in, in the 60s. And so you can see this, this is upscaling and upgrading this historical memory uh, narrative uh, from in this building itself, how it's the, how, how the new building is much more prominent and, yeah, and looks much more important in central for, for the cityscape as well. I'm moving next into the, the I want this, obviously we have to mention this because um, Great Patriotic War was not just about victory in heroic narrative, it was also very much about victimhood. And uh, again, uh, what we can observe here, it's very much development, but also upgrading, kind of upscaling the, 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 the memory, uh, memorial, uh, um, memorials, but also memory narratives. And here on the, on the left side, you can see the cutting, you probably have heard about this uh, story. This is a memorial opened in 1969. Uh, dedicated to the commemoration of the of all Belarusian vill villages which were burned down together with the uh, with residents and there were over 600 I think villages like that in Belarus. But uh, in the middle, Krasny Birach, it's it's uh, it's a memorial on the place of the concentration camp for children. This is why it looks actually like a classroom. Uh, this is where the children were taken because they they were used kind of to just to to donate blood to German um, soldiers. And most of the time they actually died after that because they, they nobody, nobody cares. They were used just as a, like a biological material. So this is, uh, it's not very far from Gomel, uh, uh, the place uh, is located. And the, the, the third place is Trastinets. It's, it's a former concentration camp, once again, located um, uh, not far from Minsk, uh, it's, it's a Nazi concentration camp. So this is a new uh, monument, again, uh, very recently opened. This is just shows us the upgrading the, the memory in uh, the memory of the Great Patriotic Great. War in Belarus. What happens to the uh, former uh, memory narrative, which was kind of promoted in the night since nineties by the Belarusian People Front, but also other memory activists and political parties and actors. Uh, with the rise of Lukashenko and coming after he came to power and consolidated his power, these people on these actors, this societal movement and memory activists and various groups, they didn't cease to exist. They, they continued their activities somehow on the margins of public life. You couldn't possibly see anything about them on the, on the TV, for example. But, the, but um, Nevertheless, there were some spaces, well, obviously with the internet and, and even some media also allowed to, to exist in Belarus, this, um, the, the, this memory activity continued. And what state preferred to for, forget, for example, is there was no information about this victims of Stalinism in Belarus in the official space, but this place has very much existed. So you can see a couple of um, the photographs here from Kurapati again, memorial site, even though the official the site was registered as, a, as, a, as an important memorial site on, on the cultural values, so-called uh, uh, list. But major memory, memory, memory work was conducted by independent activists on even private, private individuals. And you can see all these wooden crosses because it's a, it's a kind of wooded area. So you can see all these uh, crosses, some uh, icons painted on, on stone. The articles are written by the leader of uh, and a creator, Zanon Pazniak, kind of, creator of Belarus and People Front, who talked about the importance of memory of victims of Stalinism for uh, reinventing, for rethinking uh, uh, Belarusian identity and Belarusian society in the 20th century. So it was, this is how it connects Kuropati as a the mass execution, the, the mass burial site, execution site, with this whole idea of reclaiming Belarusian liberating from the spells of this po positive thinking about the Soviet Union. So building genuine Belarusian state uh, on the foundation of this martyrological project of the nation. 
it's worth mentioning actually that this is not very easy. Uh, I mean, it is, there are multiple tensions around uh, surrounding this Kurapati side because for many actors who think, see Kurapati as a very specific, as a kind of as a Belarusian Golgotha, if you want, so it's very important national uh, memory space. So they don't really, they, they're not really easy to tolerate the fact that, for example, there are multiple activities surrounding Kurapati which uh, talk about Polish uh, Kurapati as the Polish memory space because there are some ideas or kind of guesses that there the had been probably Polish victims who were executed and buried in this site. So um, there were multiple cases of vandalism of, of crosses put there by Polish delegation. So the, it's not very kind of easy. Another example of kind of diluting this uh, Belarusian national narrative, memory narrative, is it, 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 this monument uh, put there by one of the Jewish activists who talks about the, the brothers in faith, Jews, brothers, Christians, Muslims. So it's a kind of very inclusive type of idea uh, about victims of Stalinism. Uh, so yeah. These are kind of very different ideas. I don't have much time, I'm afraid, so I'm just skipping. This is uh, the, the story about Kurapati. What is really interesting, um, I just want to mention here again, so to kind of to signpost uh, this idea that since 2014, it's probably around this time, 14, about 14, around this period of Maidan or in Ukraine, we could observe some sort of soft Belarusization in the official identity politics. What it meant in practice, the whole idea of kind of rethinking that Belarus is not just part of uh, Slavic, uh, pan-Slavic, uh, kind of Eastern, Eastern Slavic civilization together with Russia, but also Belarusian uh, people have uh, had their own kind of medieval past, which was not necessarily uh, common with Russia. So this came again um, in uh, the together with this whole idea of rethinking the, the urban space in Minsk and many other big cities like in Vitebsk and Magilov uh, and uh, some others you, we could see this in interest in reconstruction of uh, old towns or old, 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 old fra fragments of historical cities which could be seen in a way as, as a kind of reinterpretation and revision of this Soviet uh, narrative about Belarus. Uh, one of the examples of such revision uh, could be seen as a, a symbol of Magdeburg rights in Minsk. Um, in 19, 1499, Minsk was granted Magdeburg rights. You probably know what it means. It's a sort of a set of town privileges which regulated kind of the autonomy rights and these uh, rights were cancelled by Russian Emperor Nicholas I uh, when Belarusian lands kind of got incorporated into the Russian Tsarist Empire. And you can see that in 2014 uh, in Minsk, uh, in, one, in, in one of uh, the squares, the monuments, uh, monument dedicated to the Magdeburg rights was opened. It's, again, it's thinking about Belarus and Minsk in particular uh, in categories of its history, which goes beyond its connections with Russia, but it's kind of re-establishing, reinventing, re uh, re uh, bringing into uh, public spaces this ideas of Belarusian's past, which was actually in fact common with Lithuanians, Polish, rather than with Russians. When we think about the, 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 the past, the Soviet past, I just want to sign Paul before moving finally to the Belarusian protest, I want to sign Paul that there's a whole idea, uh, identity dilemma when we think about the, 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 the attitude towards the Soviet history and to towards the Soviet past. What we see here, that from the perspective of a project proposed by Lukashenko, Belarusians were uh, kind of modernized during the Soviet times so the whole set of experiences and the socialist state defending country of Soviet Union from Nazi Germany was starting a re rebuilding country in post-war decades. It was all the story of how Belarusians became a modern nation. In the oppositional discourse, 
they claim that Soviet project, this was a project of kind of colonization, this, they were just victims in this process. And the project itself was very alien, it was anti-Belarusian. And in fact, when we think about this, uh, this is about the agency, who were Belarusians, were they heroes, were they modern nation, like prosperous and uh, uh, living in pro prosperous and stable society, or were they just victims who were suffering from Russians or from, so from Soviets and only were liberated in the, in the 90s. And uh, in fact, when we think about this um, kind of mode of thinking about legacy, uh, but also about the, the kind of, mm, the agency of the Belarusian people in their own history. So we, we are talking, we kind of balancing here between uh, hero, heroic warrior, warriors, creators or victims. And obviously for Lukashenko identity project, it was clear that he wanted the whole idea of Lukashenko before 2020 was idea to, to kind of build very modern society, prosperous, who tried to build, you know, I don't know, some biotechnical, bring biotechnical technologies, uh, biotechnical corporations, uh, who were the country which was very advanced. This is how he allowed to develop IT sector, for example, in the country. So it was a proof for him that he is a very capable leader and that the, the, the country can be very prosperous and uh, under authoritarian uh, kind of uh, uh, rule. So this was the whole idea of shaping this image of Belarus as modern, active, dynamic, and and all these images would be joined kind of, would, would, would be uh, uh, matched with, with the image of him as a very successful leader or manager, if you want. Uh, I don't think we have much time left, so I don't really, we probably had uh, in some other lectures this discussion, what happened when in, uh, before the election in 2020. So all people, what is really important for me at the moment, just to, to, to kind of to signal that all those who, who came to contest Lukashenko in presidential election in 2020, they were not really people uh, uh, associated with what I we, we would could call old ideological opposition in Belarus. So this is long, uh, well, not very long, in fact, but tradition of contesting uh, Lukashenko, his discourse, his history, his memory narrative, his language policy. All people who came to as a major candidates and uh, opponents of Lukashenko in 2020 were people, people who were not associated with all this ideological project. They were people who wanted something different. They, they were kind of demonstrating that he is not very successful in his identity, in, in his managing country. Uh, they, they like Tikhanovsky who traveled across the country and just showed how uh, badly actually country in fact man, uh, is being managed in, uh, 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 behind this propaganda image of Belarus as a success story. Uh, he, he showed multiple failures and, and, and problems. And so on and so on. What is just uh, um, kind of? I don't think we have time for, for going into to many details. Uh, so when uh, new leadership, this unexpected leadership of Tikhanovskaya and other uh, and three ladies like uh, Kalesnik and Zepkala, uh, they didn't really come uh, with a political project. In fact, in August, in, in, in the summer 2020, ever since they promised uh, there's just new fair, free and fair election, they promised uh, freedom to political prisoners and stop violence. And obviously this was an extremely wide, broad appeal, which many people found that they could kind of respond to, to this when they, 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 they went to give the uh, votes in the election. I don't want to speak about this. So one now I, I want to now I'm going already to protest to kind of we skip the election itself um, an event. What happened? You I assume you you know something. What is really important now? I'm going to kind of to protest, but also obviously what is really different and special about the protest in Belarusian summit 2020, this protest were not associated with any specific social movement. And this is why, for example, for scholars, it's very different, difficult to kind of to study this type of a protest because all literature about social movements, it 
kind of has some assumptions about the existence of some groups with some paradigms, uh, some programs, and which come to mobilize society. In this case, it was very clear that this, this mobilization, a mass mobilization protest, they, 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 can, they can be characterized as a kind of eventful protest when the mobilization itself was not prepared by something what was happening before, but it in itself became a, 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 a kind of a space where events were happening. And going back to the title of my uh, presentation about the memory politics and historical symbolism, and obviously what you can see here in one of the dominant images of, of, this, uh, of this protest became a white red a white flag, and this was a major symbol, historical symbol of the Belarusian older position. But in this case, and what I think you can see in this image, it, these people who came with, with, with this flag, they, they didn't come to kind of to, because of those, the, because of those ideas associated with this particular flag and this historical symbol, they came uh, because this flag has been reinvented for him and in, in, in the whole idea, for example, of victory, victory being Belarusians as Victorians in the Great Patriotic War has been now reappropriated and you see this image, kind of the flag wrapping the motherland sculpture uh, next to the Museum of the History of Great Patriotic War. It's about kind of reinventing idea that flag and this victory now, because this is the site of victory, like the celebration of the victory in the Great Patriotic War. Now it's been reinvented as a victory um, in the struggle against Lukashenko regime. And this is what I could call uh, as, a, as a kind of as a historical and uh, blended new blended historical symbolism. I'm sorry for typo here on, on the slide. Because I think this the whole idea and um, the prominence of the museum of the and uh, this memorial um, m memorial uh, of of the uh, hero city of Minsk, Obelisk. This is what you saw on this um, museum surrounding uh, uh, areas. Now has been kind of merged together with this white red white tricolor and to, to show this this kind of this new idea of motherland motherland which has been and in people who are victorious, who, who become heroes because they, they celebrate the victory over the, um, the Lukashenko regime. And so this whole idea of kind of uh, and symbol of the glorious Soviet past, so-called, has been reinvented now as uh, the, the, this, in this heroic parties of uh, Belarusian uh, heroism and pro protesters as, as heroes of the new time who uh, celebrate the victory of the author authoritarian regime. Obviously, we know that this victory didn't yet happen, but this was a moment, uh, the, this was the, the major atmosphere of that moment. And obviously, it's really kind of interesting that the, the, the Lukashenko very quickly understood that the, um, the, the danger of this type of reinterpretation and reappropriation of, of this symbolism of this museum. So we, he quickly, next week already, this museum area was very heavily protected and wired against protesters and they couldn't come anywhere close to this uh, space. Here are just a few more examples of how the imagery of, of the Second World War, or Great Patriotic War if you want, was, was reappropriated and used by Belarusian protesters in the uh, working on this imagery on, 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 on of the Belarusian pro uh, protests. So the, here you can see the, the Minsk-based artist Vika Zhukovska, who created this Motherland Coast 2020 image, which is clearly uh, has this historical reference to the Motherland Coast figure and uh, monument, uh, which was created in 1967 in Volgograd. So again, it's it's kind of appealing to this victorious narrative, to the sense of righteousness which was uh, encrypted and the Belarusian memory of war. Another example of mother, motherland, Masha Kols, uh, well, I assume you probably have heard about the, the, this persona, Marina Kolesnikova, who was one of three ladies and she is the one who has been arrested and remains in prison uh, at the moment. 
And this was a work uh, which was created by Anna Redko uh, in September, right after, I think, the arrest of Maria Kalesnikova. There was a whole story that actually for Lukashenko it would have been much more convenient if she just uh, went to exile and moved somewhere. So they did try to, to, to transport her to the border to ex uh, simply expel from the country, but they did not succeed because she turned uh, her passport, as you see uh, this on, on this poster, Motherland Masha course. Uh, another example of using this imagery of the great patriotic war in, and the discourse uh, of protesters, there was this community of the Belarusian cyber partisans. Uh, and again, it's, it refers to, to something bigger. I did not, ha did not have enough time to talk about this in details, but in Belarus, there is this mythologized self-image of partisan republic, uh, the, as a republic which played a very important role in the victory uh, with, by uh, contributing uh, this, uh, this, uh, the activities of partisans in the Belarusian forests who were very active. So this, again, this whole idea of historical narrative of Belarusians as partisans, of a, as a nation of partisans, uh, was reinvented uh, with the whole idea of Belarusian cyber, cyber partisans who were kind of saying that they are waging a guerrilla war on the Poshenko regime. They were kind of, I think they, 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 for some short period of, of time, they, they issued regularly some uh, information about the activities, like leaking personal data of um, the, or, or police officers complicit in violence or hacking government sites. Uh, at least in August, September, this was what was happening. It was also interesting that uh, on one of the Sunday marches, uh, which uh, exactly on the October 18th, uh, here I give you the, the fragment from next uh, Telegram channel, which was one of a very important instru instrument in kind of, um, directing and mobilizing the Sunday and uh, organizing su su Sunday marches. And this is what it was saying that partisans come to the march to demonstrate that we, the descendants of glory warriors and partisans, are worthy of our ancestors uh, who once defeated of fascism. So once again, it re reinvents uh, the whole idea of people, partisans, the same story which was very central to the memory narrative advanced by Lukashenko, promoted by Lukashenko, but now it turns against actually him. Uh, in a, likewise, some of the stories you, again, I, I assume you know a little bit about the, 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 the violence which was unleashed by Lukashenko against protesters. This was his kind of reaction and, uh, to, 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 to this uh, rapid mobilization. And you could, what you could see, especially in social media, circulating multiple images which were kind of uh, building connections between what was happening in Belarus during the Nazi, uh, the Nazi occupation uh, in the 40s and of uh, what is happening today. And very often this whole kind of idea of uh, present day regime, Lukashenko regime as occupying regime, as fascist regime becomes kind of a very important way to demonstrate that its alienness, its kind of its um, it's hostility towards Belarusian people and Belarusian society. This is one more reference. Uh, again, this, this was a comparison made um, between the film which come and see, uh, the, the, one of the Soviet very prominent films which tells the story about the Belarusian experience of Nazi occupation, uh, which was um, made in 1985. And this is a photograph made one by a journalist. Uh, this is a uh, show the protester who was released from a Christian detention center. So you see again this uh, parallel images. It would be uh, wrong not to mention the importance of uh, the, the old former alternative memory narrative and its prominence and importance in the Belarusian protest as well. For example, already on the 21st of August, um, the human chain, and it's very also interesting that the whole idea of building human chain as in political action, uh, uh, it refers actually to Baltic way uh, when around two million people 
in 1989 uh, connected three, uh, uh, three capital cities of, of Baltic countries, uh, republics back, by, uh, back then, uh, to the Soviet Union. So in this uh, case, we, are, uh, we see the human chain which was built to connect the Christian, which is a detention center where most people of, of, who were arrested during the protest were first transported before they could be distributed and among different institutions uh, and detention centers. So the, the building uh, the, uh, this human chain between uh, a Christian uh, center and Kuba party brings back this, this, this whole kind of reference and idea of commemorating Kurapat and victims of Stalinism and bringing this memory to the sp memory space in 2020. I imagine I'm thinking already a little bit more time than I promised. So I'm all, almost finished. And once again, I just mentioned this Baltic Way. Uh, new Baltic Way was also built in uh, Lithuania from Vilnius to the Belarusian border, uh, with many Lithuanians, but also Belarusians uh, living in, in Lit Lithuania who came to participate. And it's very impor important to see this kind of political action as a way to, on the one hand, to reference to 1989 uh, memory, again, liberation from the Soviet Union and the, from the Soviet past, but also bringing and connecting Belarus with, with uh, this Eastern European political and cultural space and uh, the symbolic reintegration of Belarus into this uh, kind of community of small Eastern European nations. Another act of kind of um, rethinking contemporary like, 2020 story of what was happening in, in Belarus with, with this post-communist development became the project of uh, Black of Bo Book of Belarus. I don't know how much you know, but this the Black Book of Communism. This was a project of document, documenting, uh, collecting documents about crimes committed by communist states. Uh, yeah, the project was launched in 1997 uh, by a group of um, uh, group of historians, and uh, so the whole idea of launching something similar in Belarus it was very much building uh, kind of parallels with what was happening during the communism and connecting this to this with the story of violence and crimes committed by Lukashenko regime. So I'm kind of uh, finishing with this. What I wanted to say and to show you that protests, in fact, did create a very in new, unique space in the Belarusian uh, history because these two different disconnecting and competing narratives of the past, one focused on the Great Patriotic War and other, the second one focused on the memory of the victims of Stalinism, they have been kind of mixed uh, because uh, the new experience, what happened to the Russian Belarusian people in the protest, it also this um, heightened spirit of mobilization, but also traumatized by by um, uh, unprecedented violence unleashed by Lukashenko by police, all right, police. All both the whole idea of heroism and victory, but also suffering, have been now narrated in, in historical symbolism became very important kind of resource which delivered imagery for people to tell the story what what happened to them in 2020 and those images which i show you kind of i try to demonstrate how history is on the one hand important but also how these divisions which used to be have been um uh, kind of not really overcome but rather crossed and re 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 interpreted. 